I'm incredibly excited and honored to have Alice Hammond here to talk a little bit about Karen Lamont and her uh, use of the kimono and her sculptures that you all saw when you walked in in the front. As many of you know, we do own another Karen Lamont sculpture that's in Morrill Hall, which looks quite a bit different from this, from these ones in front. And so it's really wonderful to have different aspects of an artist. It doesn't work in one <laughs> in, in, in our collection in this exhibition versus that one. And so Alice has really been lovely to work with and borrowing all of these that you saw in the front. Uh, and she has worked with Karen for about two years. She works with Gerald Peters Gallery that is based in New York City and Santa Fe. Uh, and she's worked for him for about seven years, I believe, and working with different artists and different um, different types of materials and mediums. And so Karen, she's worked with for about two years to really help install these, as you can tell, massive cast glass, ceramic. Um, we don't have any of the metal. And so she's gonna talk a little bit about Karen and her process uh, and her other artwork and especially the kimono today. So thank you so much for coming all the way out here from Seattle. We're happy to have you. you. And let's see what she has to say. Well, thank you all for being here today. I am so impressed to see such a culturally engaged crowd here on a Sunday afternoon. It's really nice to see. Um, Karen Lamont uh, is very, um, very happy that her works are included in this exhibition. So both she and I are just thrilled um, uh, that they're here at the museum. I'm just going to talk very briefly about my role working with her. Um, as a director with Gerald Peters, I, I work very closely with Lamont, as Adrian mentioned, to organize exhibitions, to do a lot of administrative tasks that I won't get into. But as part of that, I, I really get kind of a front row seat to seeing, um, seeing Lamont's artistic process generally um, as well as her new projects and it's been really exciting for me and I feel tremendously privileged to be working so closely with such a remarkable artist. So with that I'm going to talk a little bit about Lamont's early career um, and the kinds of works that she was doing and the process that she went through um, to get to the point where she was making her kimonos. So Karen Lamont went to the Rhode Island School of Design and graduated in 1990. Um, at RISD, she'd worked a lot with uh, sculpture and especially with glass as a medium there. Um, and when she got out, she did a lot of work in sort of smaller scale blown glass objects, um, relatively minor works. But she developed this idea that she wanted to make a monumental life-size glass cast of a dress. And the only place that would really provide the resources for her to do that was Prague. Um, Prague has a long, long history of uh, fabulous glass making, and they had developed the technology to make these huge casts. So she applied for a Fulbright um, and received a Fulbright grant to spend a year in Prague working in these glass workshops in order to realize her vision. Um, and, and that was in 1999. Um, and then the result of that year was that in 2000, she created this work, Vestige, um, which is up on the screen in front of you. It is a hollow glass dress that suggests um, the body of a woman who might be wearing it below. Um, Arthur Danto, who was one of the earliest major critics to write on Lamont's work, was really intrigued with her from an early stage in her career. And he saw this work Vestige. And about Vestige, he wrote, that vestige is inseparable from the enfleshed person within. 
but it is also co-implicated with the circumstances in which it is appropriately worn. It is worn on and as part of special occasions. Not a dress in which one does chores or runs errands. It rejects everydayness. It goes with candlelight and music, sweeping staircases and jewelry, flowers and wine. And so I think this quote gets to um, a lot of what Lamont was trying to do. She is thinking about clothing as, um, as something that communicates our social context to us. We look at this dress and we think about, um, you know, who is this woman? Where is she going? What is she doing? She's definitely not running errands. We know that. So um, she continued in this vein after her Fulbright year and developed a body of work uh, that she calls absence adorned. Um, the absent form of the female figure adorned in these opulent glass dresses, um, some of which I'm going to show you now. This is from a recent installation um, in Prague, actually from about two years ago, where these early works were shown. And at this point, um, Lamont had started to work with um, plaster casts from live models. So whereas Vestige had been um, sort of an imagined female form, she's now working with uh, real female bodies that she's putting these dresses on. And so you can see how the work becomes um, certainly more technical as she progresses forward. Um, but it sort of, it, it maintains this same um, notion of sensuality and sort of beauty and, um, and communication of context. And about, um, about working in glass, Lamont has written that cast glass allows me to portray two dimensions simultaneously illuminating the relationship between public and private, civilization and subject, and time and timelessness. The fragility and transparency of glass provide a metaphor for the continuous relationship between our natural and social skins. Sorry, I'm gonna read the rest of this. Um, the boundaries between body and drapery dissolve and fabric is transubstantiated into flesh. So having gone through this process um, that she spent probably about six years on in the early 2000s to create this body of work, she started to think more about um, how clothing, and how um, garments communicate social contexts in a totally distinct cultural, um, cultural environment. And she wanted to work with a kind of clothing that would be entirely distinct from uh, the Western European notions of beauty that you see um, displayed in these early works. So what she decided to do is pursue um, working with kimonos. And um, I'm gonna talk for a moment about the history of the kimono, just, uh, just as context for why I think this was an especially appropriate choice. And Diane's gonna have to bear with me because I know that you went to the kimono lecture and probably know much more than I do about this, but we're, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try. Um, so the first kimono, the sort of ancestor of the kimono, was the kisode, which was developed during the Heian period between 794 and 1192. A simple T-shaped garment cut to fit every sort of body type, and it was commonly worn on every level of Japanese society. It then was really further developed into a close 
cousin to the modern day kimono in the Edo period um, from 1600 to 1868, which was a period of real cultural isolation in Japan. Um, they were not looking at Western European influences um, or even uh, closer Asian influences, like from the um, Chinese trade routes and so forth. So this is really a garment <clears throat> that, um, that exudes, for lack of a better word, a sort of pure form of Japanese culture and history. Um, and for Lamont, it was so obviously a different kind of silhouette than the one that we see in these early works. Um, it is not a silhouette that uh, emphasizes the curves of a woman's body. It is instead, um, it instead makes a sort of cylindrical uh, form of the woman's body and it masks those cur natural curves with padding and binding. Now during the Meiji period, which followed the Edo period um, with the Meiji Emperor, um, Japan became uh, not culturally isolated anymore. The Meiji Emperor saw that um, the Americans and Europeans were sort of dominating in terms of their colonial conquests. And he was very interested in incorporating a lot of Western influence into Japan at the time to show that Japan was um, you know, capable of playing on the main world stage and that uh, Japan was going to make major technological advances and influence global culture and so forth. So there actually um, was this period where, you know, even the Meiji emperor and empress started wearing Western style clothing. They often made it from kimono material, but it was Western. And they um, put out woodblock prints of themselves in this Western style of clothing to communicate to um, society that this was a culture that was um, on board with European technologies. So what happened was um, Japanese men started, in, men in particular, started wearing Western style dress to work, especially if they worked in an official capacity in the government, for example. But they'd come home and put their kimonos back on. Um, and this was a time when it, there really was a major influence, uh, influx of Western culture. So every level of Japanese society felt this. And Anna Jackson, who's written extensively on kimonos, has said that, observed rather, that when a society experiences a period of enormous change, the significance and meaning of dress demands more attention. It was in the Meiji period that the word kimono, or the thing worn, gained broad currency. So Japan is no longer culturally isolated, having seen European and American cultural dominance. This was a time when um, everyone was sort of wondering, what, what is it that I wear? And ultimately, toward the end of this period, there was a kind of backlash toward nationalism. And, um, and women and men alike really embraced the kimono and went back to wearing it. Um, so Cynthia Green, who's written a lot about pop culture and costumes, um, has observed recently that as Japan was undergoing this fundamental change on multiple levels, Japanese women wearing the kimono were a reassuring visual image. Um, the kimono became a visible yet silent link between woman, mother, and cultural protector. Even today, the kimono is a reminder of Japan's core culture as it was just before its fundamental change. So um, women in particular became responsible for sort of um, embodying this 
um, cultural center by wearing the kimono during this time. And so all this is to say that if Lamont wanted to find a garment that embodies a distinct culture, she found the right one. Um, so she went, um, that's Lamont on the right side of this image. She went to Kyoto, um, she went to Kyoto in 2007. She uh, received a grant from the Japanese American Friendship Commission. And over a period of seven months, she studied every aspect of the kimono. Um, its iconography, the specific meaning of motifs used in the kimono, obi bows, um, connotations of sleeve lengths, etc. And you can see here she's um, really focusing on learning directly from these major uh, kimono masters that she learned from during this time. So at the end of the seven months, um, she came back to Prague with 250 kimonos, I think maybe even more than that. And she's told me a very traumatic story about how um, she and her husband got to the airport and were trying to get these kimonos on the plane and basically were told that they couldn't unless they spent like all of the money they had thousands and thousands of dollars to get the kimonos on and it was like oh my god so she got over that they worked it out she got them back to the studio but I think that ultimately the real challenge she had was figuring out what to do with all of these kimonos now that she's <laughs> now that she's had this experience um, and it, it was really not simply a matter of saying, okay, well, I've already made some hollow glass dresses. I'm just gonna do the same thing with these kimonos. That's, um, she went through a much more significant thought process. And the result was that she greatly expanded um, the media and materials that she had been used to working with and the resulting body of work represents um, a major sort of stylistic shift away from her earlier works. Um, not only um, in the difference of garment that she used, but also, um, also in other ways that I'm gonna talk about a little bit now. It was really important for Lamont to make sure that she was creating an authentic portrayal of the kimono as a cultural symbol. And she really um, internalized much of her thought process and experience in Japan, uh, which is reflected in the materials that she ultimately used. So here she is in the studio. Um, the kimonos that you see here that she's working with are modeled on um, mannequins, but they're actually mannequins that she developed from biometric data of Japanese women. So they are, uh, in fact, life-size mannequins of Japanese women that um, is entirely accurate as much as anyone can be. And in the... Um, She's kneeling on the floor next to one of them. She is applying wax to it, which she will use to later make a mold from the garment to create her sculpture. So the first material other than glass that, um, that I'm gonna talk about is ceramics. This is an image of some of her ceramic sculpture drawing, getting ready to go in, into, um, into the kiln. And I want to start out by, I think there are a lot of really important ways in which clay is especially important. Um, to her kimono works and the way that they relate directly to Japanese culture. Um, Karen has written that, I think clay is the humblest of all materials. It's just earth. 
I am drawn to it because it is rudimentary and universal. It's been used for thousands of years in every culture to make everything from daily or functional objects to religious or symbolic objects. And one thing that happened when she was making her sculpture in ceramic is that um, one, a number of these early kimonos she created exploded. And you can see <laughs> the, um, the results of that here in this photo. And so she thought, well, what am I going to do with these? And decided ultimately to put them back together. And here you can see the process of these, um, of these kimonos getting, um, getting put back together. Yeah, it looks like scotch tape. Um, but the result was that she, she found her way to kintsugi, which is um, a very old uh, process by which um, Japanese ceramic makers would embrace um, embrace breakage, embrace flaws, and in fact highlight the flaws in, um, in an object by decorating them, highlighting them with this, um, it would be powdered mineral, gold was popular, um, Lamont used powdered gold uh, in order to display these, um, these cracks. And in fact, when I was looking up Kintsugi to make sure that I knew um, what I was talking about here today, I discovered that the Kintsugi uh, Wikipedia page has this picture of Lamont's kimono on it as, a as an example of how it's being used by contemporary artists today. Um, here's another example of one of these exploded kimonos and the way that she um, she used the flaws as an aesthetic element. And um, so this, this uh, Kintsugi technique really got translated into a number of aspects in her work. So this kimono is on view here at the museum. And it was not one of the works that exploded, but she is using um, this gold leaf, uh, gold technique um, to create the sort of ornamentation and um, remind us that the kimono fabric uh, is often you know, beautifully and exuberantly displayed, which, um, which her other media would not show as, as predominantly. You can see here um, how she's sort of filled in these little cracks. So here is a work, it's called Chado, which means tea ceremony. It is not on view at the museum now, but it is the work that resulted from the model she was working on in the studio photos that I showed you earlier. It's really um, a prime sort of example of how Lamont's embodying uh, all of these um, Japanese techniques and um, ceramic traditions. Celadon is a very old, very important Japanese glaze. Um, the act of performing a tea ceremony is, of course, quite a fundamental and important aspect of Japanese culture. So I think that this is a really a prime example of how she, um, she really cared about creating a, an authentic representation. Um, this work is kabuki. It is the only man uh, model that Lamont has ever done. And you can see again in these detail shots that she has 
Um, she's used a celadon glaze as well, but she's also used a crackle glaze on the hem of the kimono and more of this, um, this gold that sort of references uh, the kintsugi repairs. So there are no metal um, works in this show, but I do want to talk about the metal works just for a few minutes. Um, because as part of um, Lamont's explorations with ceramics and the kintsugi that we talked about, she embraced this notion of wabi-sabi, which means beauty and imperfection. Um, it's, an object is more interesting and engaging when it's not pristine. So this kimono, which is made of rusted iron, I think exemplifies how that concept sort of plays out in the rest of her works. Um, first of all, when a metal comes out of casting, there is an opportunity to refine the surface, smooth it out. You can see that this surface has been left really for the most part, exactly as it was when it came out of the cast. She has embraced um, the sort of cracks and, and irregularities in the surface. And in fact, the reason I use this cast as a great example is that um, there is a crack between, um, between the seams in the garment that I've tried to show in the detail shot on the right, that Lamont, um, as part of embracing this concept, left as a crack um, when it came out of the cast. And this is just um, an example of how these works um, look when, when they're done in bronze. This is the same model of the black and gold ceramic that is on view in the gallery. And um, what's interesting about the metals is they definitely translate the, um, the intricacies of the fabric and the patterns in a completely different way. This is an iron version of, um, of the glass bijin that is on view out in the gallery. You can see that gorgeous brocade that has come through so beautifully um, in the, in the back, on the back of the obi bow. So finally, we come back to glass. Um, Glass uh, was obviously a material that Lamont had worked with extensively before she got to the kimonos. And in the context of choosing materials for her kimonos, she chose glass to, um, to connote a sense of spirituality. Um, the way that the glass reveals a little bit of the, uh, you know, articulation of the body beneath, um, she felt was appropriate. It reveals this sort of um, intangible quality, um, intangible sort of spiritual quality that these works really embody, I think. And so these are just some examples. Having seen the iron version of this work, um, it's really remarkable how, you know, you can be working with the same model, and once you change material, it the work just has a completely different effect. So ultimately, Oh, and here's, here's the child's kimono that's also on view. So ultimately, um, 
in determining what this whole body of work meant and deciding how to characterize it and what to call it. Um, Lamont ultimately referenced the um, Yukioe uh, woodblock prints of the Edo period. And on the one hand, there are a lot of really direct stylistic connections between the prints made um, during that Edo period and kimonos. For one thing, um, many of the makers of these woodblock prints would very carefully consult the Hingata Bon, which were pattern books distributed um, during the Edo period that provided um, a, a detailed uh, display of the motifs that one would use to decorate a kimono. Um, so stylistically, uh, right off the bat, there is this connection. Um, and this is also one of the works in the exhibition on the right here, this ceramic maquette. And um, again, you know, it strikes me that you can see how much Lamont was looking at these prints and thinking about posture. Um, this figure really embodies the same kind of curve and, um, and really sensuality that you see in the geishas depicted in these woodblock prints. But ultimately, I think that the most important connection uh, that Lamont made between these works and um, the woodblock prints is intention. Um, the depictions of the floating world were meant to transport viewers. Um, these woodblock prints, and there are a number behind me that you can see right after the talk, um, displayed uh, courtesans, kabuki actors, um, tea ceremonies, scenes of pleasure that were meant to transport their viewers sort of above, uh, literally above the mundanity of early, of earthly life, everyday life, transport us um, intellectually and emotionally to a different place. And the kimono as a garment conveys a completely different type of, um, different expression of sensuality, right, than, um, than the Western evening gowns that we all think about and that um, that Lamont made earlier in her career, but it still is its own form of sensuality. It still is its own, um, it embodies its own method of, of transporting us to a place where we, um, where we go to escape thinking about bills and errands. And so in that way, um, Lamont had set out to look at cultural differences and different expressions of beauty, but at the end of the day, we really arrive back in the same place where we're looking at a garment that, as Danto says, um, transports us to this sort of scene of, of beauty and pleasure, which is um, ultimately the point of much of what human civilizations um, create and need to create. So um, that's the last thing I'm gonna say, I think. I'm happy to take some questions. <laughs> Allison. <laughs> so what's next for here? Do you have any sneak peeks? <laughs> um, I don't have any sneak peeks. I can tell you that she's very focused on working with clouds and weather. And is her studio still in Prague? <laughs> <laughs>
Yes, she um, she established her studio in Prague uh, virtually as soon as she finished her Fulbright because she realized that's where she needed to be to continue doing the work that she wanted to do. It struck me that the fused glass kimonos have an element of ghostliness to them that, you know, folk tales of Japan are just, lots of them include ghosts. I don't know if, if she sees that in those, but. She absolutely does. Um, she refers to it as a sense of um, kind of the transient nature of beauty. Uh, so, it, I, which I think is what you're getting at, is this sort of absent figure it does convey a sense of sort of melancholy and loss um, and, and ghostliness. So yes. Could you tell us a little bit more about her process? You mentioned that she works with plaster casts of actual human bodies and you said something about putting some wax on the kimono in one of the um, uh, images. Could you yeah. tell us a little bit more kind of a step-by-step -step process? Um, so I'm not going to get into a super technical discussion of it because invariably I will like um, mistake and make a mistake and say something that's not correct and then it will live in infamy and you know Karen will get upset with me. So um, basically the process is that um, first these garments are put on um, a mannequin in the case of the kimonos or um, a plaster cast made from a live model. And she goes through a process to stiffen it to the point where she can then make a mother mold of it and essentially follows the same process you would follow for lost wax casting where you've got a mother mold and you pour, uh, pour the metal in and so forth. With glass, it gets significantly more complicated than that, but at the end of the day, it's a very similar process. And when she made the ceramics, um, she basically engineered this way in which um, it was molded clay, um, which would then need to dry completely, so she kind of engineered this hollow cast so that the ceramics could go through a, some, uh, you know, comparable process and then be fired. Does she know why those first ones exploded? Obviously they don't anymore. Does she realize like what went wrong with those ones? I mean, well, obviously they came out great anyways. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not sure. That I, I, I assume that it was an issue with the kiln temperature. Um, that it wasn't appropriately. Were those the first ones she had even tried? So I don't think that those were the very first ones, but I believe that they were close to the, the beginning of her ceramic series and process. It's kind of great that you can, you know, many artists, things explode and you're just done with it then, right? You know, mm -hmm. the ability to take it and remake it and make it beautiful. It's also very Japanese and so really Yeah, lovely. and I do think it was disappointing when she opened the kiln. I 100%. <laughs> yeah, yes, you're right, she made lemonade, <laughs> absolutely. Do you know how she stiffened the fabric so that it could stand that process? Uh, the mold making process. She's she uses wax. She uses a lot of hairspray initially. It's a uh, yeah seriously to stiffen it up. It's a multi phase process where she yeah, um, and then she does the outside and inside. So she'll press the fabric into the mold on the outside, and then she's got to press it on the inside. I have to imagine that this is a wildly expensive endeavor that she's doing. So who are her collect is it collectors and museums who's funding these things at this point? Did she, when they're originally as a full ride, is she always seeking funding for different things or people are just snapping statues off? 
Yeah, at this point, she has a major collector following, um, and she's in a number of museum collections. So, um, yes, absolutely, she's in a she's in a uh, I, she's a successful commercial artist, effectively at this point. Is she making multiples of what she's cast? I mean, she's yes, done yes, all of the glass works. The, and the metal works are multiples. The ceramics are um, are working with the same models that she uses for the metals and the glass works, but each of the surfaces is different. So um, the ceramics are the only ones in which uh, each each work is unique. So so was did her family have a private fortune to help set her up? Yeah. Yeah. No, she lived on cabbage soup for a long period of time when she was starting out. <laughs> um, I, I'm told that the Fulbright only gave her so much cash and the cabbage soup was part of her life for a while. <laughs> so she has her studio. Is she literally pouring the glass and the metal there? Has she got the, the wherewithal to do that, or does she take it somewhere and have it done? She has the glass works cast in in various workshops in Prague. So um, she doesn't do the pouring herself in her studio, but she goes and, and um, does it in one of these workshops, works with the glass workers to do it. Most of the metal works are cast in Italy. Yes. So after the stiffening and the wax and everything, are the kimonos totally trashed? I mean, I mean, it doesn't seem like there'd be much yeah, left. Yeah, they don't come out um, <laughs> in their original condition. No, <laughs> that's why she needed 250 <laughs> to work through this whole process. Did she use all 250? I actually don't know that. I yeah, I know. Does she have a secret stash of them she didn't use? I don't know. I actually don't know that like her favorite. What's the reaction of the Japanese people to her work? Um, from what I've seen, uh, Japanese really like it. They respond really positively to it. She's done a sh she did a show in Japan, in fact, of the kimono works. She was invited to do one there. Um, I, I think like 2010, something like that. So does she have a professional photographer um, documenting her work? So her husband is also her studio manager, and he does a lot of um, photography. I'm not sure that she always wants him to be in her studio. No, I'm kidding. She, I, <laughs> um, no, he does a wonderful job uh, taking lots of photographs. Um, and then she does work with a separate professional photographer to um, to photograph the sculptures, uh, which, you know, if you've ever tried to photograph sculpture, is hard. So she's she's found an extraordinary person to do that. Which of the mediums is the more costly? Is bronze the most costly, or glass, or pottery, or to produce? To produce. Um, well, I don't, I don't know exactly, but I believe it's glass that's probably the most capital intensive medium because um, it's an extremely temperamental medium. If it, uh, it, it doesn't matter how many times you make the same cast, things still go wrong. Um, you know, you do a pour and nine months later it can come out inexplicably cracked and you have to start all over again and there's a lot less room for error uh, casting metals. If something goes wrong with the glass, can it be remelted and reused? Usually not. Usually when it comes out of the, ca of the mold damaged, it's done. Sometimes they can do some fixes. Um, I know that the workers that she works with are tremendously skilled and absolutely you know the best in their profession but at the end of the day it's still glass
So, so the firing is a kind of deterioration of the materials, <coughs> a glass, a glass, quality glass. Well, I don't know if it's a deterioration, but it's, it's a matter of making sure all of the conditions are right for it to harden and anneal um, properly, and it's not always uh, a terribly predictable process. Yeah. Well, I mean, as far as the, the reuse of the, the glass has become less, has oh. fewer attributes that. Oh, yeah. you're talking about that, yeah, from a chemical perspective. I, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm definitely not qualified to talk to you, Theo, about that, but I'm sure that you're right and that someone else who's a scientist could answer that question. <laughs> Is the frosted texture inherent in the glass, or is she treating it with something? That look that's that's translucent. In. The tra um. That is it clear? Yeah, it um, it comes out of the mold and is not clear, but it it's then um, polished over a period of time. Is she using dyes at all or colorants in the glass? So um, in the works that I showed you in this, um, in this little presentation, no. But she has since developed a series of works that are colored glass. And the museum owns one of them. Uh, it's a beautiful dark blue figure. You should go see it. The variation five, the one? Yes, yes. the nocturne. Mm -hmm. Oh, nocturne. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she worked with um, German scientists for years to develop the colors that she used in that series. And they're really, they're only the dark or the light, really, right? And so we got a light, lighter version of that one. The darker one's almost purple, black. Yeah, um, it can be. Mm -hmm. Well, let's thank Alice again.